Hey, this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science, a podcast for data science enthusiasts where I interview practitioners, researchers and calculators about their journey, experience and talk all things about data science. Welcome to another episode of ctds.show the show where you learn how to build a career in data science in this episode i interview emily robinson senior data scientist at warby parker and jacqueline nollis principal data scientist at brightloom llc both of the amazing heroes on this episode have worked across different industries and have written amazing blog posts which i encourage you to check out They've also written a book quite literally on the topic of building a career in data science. I highly recommend that you check it out. It covers topics that aren't usually discussed almost anywhere of the soft skill side of things and things you learn through your jobs over the years that I I I haven't seen documented anywhere. As expected, uh, we t- talk about both of Emily and Jacqueline's journey in this episode along with the outline of the book. they also share a good amount of advice broadly speaking from the content in the book and beyond now without further ado here's my interview with emily robinson and jacqueline nollis all about building a career in data science and beyond please enjoy the show I am excited to be talking to two people who've actually written a book apart from being great data scientists themselves on how to build a career in data science Emily and Jacqueline thank you both uh, for joining me on the podcast Thanks for having us yeah, thank you Um I know a few people tune in through the audio so if you could just introduce yourself by speaking out your name so that they can recognize you Sure so I'm Jacqueline Nolas and i'm emily robinson great thank you uh i want to start by talking about both of your journey maybe i'll go in the alphabetical order starting with emily emily you transition from social science into machine learning can you tell us what is social science and at what point did you get interested in machine learning yeah uh so in undergraduate uh i started out and i wasn't sure what i want to major in uh so social science is broadly our fields like psychology economics sociology so essentially um applying the scientific met- method to study people uh and so this could be anything from um you know how people can effectively set goals to you know the interaction of uh race and class in certain professions and i actually ended up creating my own major in undergrad called decision sciences which was a mix of psychology economics and philosophy and i was doing some Yeah, I was doing some statistics courses and I was thinking about what I wanted to do after undergrad and I decided to uh go to INSEAD, which is a business school in France and Singapore, uh to start my PhD in organizational behavior. Uh I ended up leaving that after 2 years with my masters, but uh I've talked about this a little bit before. I find that social science is a really good background for data science because the research so my PhD was research based. and the social science research process is you you know think of a think of a question you look at some literature you either uh you gather data either by running an experiment or by uh looking for like um you know historical data sets and you analyze it and then you present the results and you share out what you've learned and that's very similar to the data science process that exactly so. sounds like data science pipeline almost yeah it is it is and the social science is is pretty quantitative so um there uh you know the kind of things that i was learning like the statistical methods it's it's very interesting um because at first people might not realize how it relates but uh, i remember uh, 
<laughs> reading one in someone's talk on like the Wikipedia entry on multi-level models and the 12 different names it comes under. And so you may have studied something like in economics and maybe it was called random effects there, not realizing that's the same thing as, you know, uh, hierarchical models or something uh, else in, in data science. So I found it like a really relevant background that was able to, to set me up well, especially uh, I started out at Etsy and I did a lot of A-B testing, online experimentation, and that was a really good background for it. Interesting. Uh, I'll probably circle back to talk about your journey after you joined the industry, but Jacqueline, I'd love to know your uh, transition as well. I believe you started with uh, industrial sciences to uh, leading up to working across different companies. At what point uh, did machine learning or data science catch your interest? So actually, uh, before I was studying industrial engineering, I actually started with math. So my undergrad and master's were in mathematics. And I originally planned on being a math professor, because that's what I thought you did if you liked math enough, because you go out and be a math professor. But so that I quickly was realized a great I, weapon for data science, I guess. Yes, that was mine. Um, but I quickly realized I hate math research. I just hate it. Like proving new theorems is terribly boring for me. And I really wanted to do is I wanted to help companies use mathematics to solve business problems. But this was well before the term data science really existed. And so I went on the job market, like I was Google search or like Monster or LinkedIn searching for mathematician and getting like these math jobs. And I ended up landing in an analytics department of a company, which is now what we would call data science, but then it was called analytics. I worked for a little while. Uh, I went to a, you know, I switched companies a little bit. And I realized like, I was, I was liking the idea of using mathematics for helping companies like this data science kind of work, but I felt like I didn't have enough in my tool belt because like my background was such theoretical math um, or applied math. And so I ended up going and getting a PhD in industrial engineering, um, which actually is like focusing on network optimization for like road networks and is all about operations and operation or op optimization operations research. And during that, I started doing consulting on the side as a, at a boutique consulting firm. And then from there, I just went into a career of data science consulting. And so I'd been a data science consultant for about like eight years and then recently just switched back to uh, industry. So very much I got into data science by wishing mathematics was more practical and then just kind of finding <laughs> a career where I could do that. So it, it, it was sort of a natural fit for you. Maybe, maybe gradient descending your way into, into the- career. Yes, that's a really good way to put it. It took me maybe 10 years of gradient descent where I'm like, okay, I like what my job is now, but yes, eventually I kind of got there. Okay, so t talking about your transitions into industry, because I, I know this is a topic you cover in the book as well. Maybe I'll follow the same order. Emily, I know you took a bootcamp course of a few weeks to transition into the field. Uh, what was your journey like and how would you advise someone to do it today? Yeah. Uh, so yes, I did the Metis Data Science Bootcamp. So it was a 12 week program uh, in person uh, at the time, although actually they just announced they are permanently going online. Uh, and yeah, sort of the reason I did that was when I was finishing up uh, the master's degree, I decided to leave the PhD. I was like, what am I interested in? I decided on data science, but you know, I knew there were some skills still missing and some of the biggest ones uh, being um, like using Git or GitHub, like version control, um, having any kind of like public work I've shared, uh, some Python knowledge. And then also, like I said, like some of the statistical techniques I kind of later learned <laughs> were like the same things, like the same, some machine learning terms you hear about, just called something different. But that being said, there were still other ones, like I never die sort of clustering. Um, so I thought this would give me a good foundation. I really liked it because... Um, Metis, at least, is very project-based, and so we'd have a couple hours of classes in the morning, but then you'd work uh, after the first week, which was a group project, you'd work on your own project, and, uh, you know, it gave you something, so I did my first blog posts um, around some of my projects, and also a tutorial um, after I learned Seaborn for plotting in Python. And uh, yeah, and I learned, uh, it also had a good network. I got to meet some, uh, Metis had, I think, a few years at that point of alums, um, now it has more. But that being said, uh, I would say for other people thinking about it is definitely, you know, do your do your research on specific boot camps like they're not all created equal. Also, for me, I was uh, living at home at the time I was coming from I'd had a stipend in in graduate school, but it was sort of just enough to live on. So it wasn't like I was going from or say supporting a family and suddenly, you know, not only getting no salary, but paying for a boot camp. And it also takes usually a couple months after the boot camp to find a job. Um, so, you know, obviously there's a big financial cost there, uh, less than a master's degree program, but more than say learning on your own or learning on a job. Uh, so it worked well for me. Um, but that being said, you know, I also know people who, uh, either cause of the bootcamp they did, you know, it, it didn't work as well. And that's cause I think 
what I saw is that the, you know, it, it's not meant to take you from zero to 60. And so mm. often the people who, you know, kind of did well out of coming out of it, um, like did have some sort of relevant background um, that like Metis just filled in some gaps rather than expecting, you know, oh, this, this boot camp alone is what's going to get me, you know, a, a, a job. It's really about like some of the skills you build up, like getting to build a portfolio um, and then leveraging also your previous education or work experience. And I, I guess that's, that's one point people miss a lot of times, which is, uh, a lot of the jargon is just rebranded across different uh, streams uh, and that's that's common to both of your journey i think so uh, after you completed the boot camp how did you uh, end up applying to different uh, job boards or how did you transition into a job yeah so metis had a um like a hiring day at the end of the boot camp where we all presented our projects and so i know there were a few folks who got jobs that way um I think I talked to a few companies that attended, but um, I don't think interviewed any of them. Uh, yeah, so I basically applied, but actually how I ended up getting my first job, which was at Etsy, was a referral. So um, I knew someone who used to work at Etsy. Um, she put me in touch with someone who is uh, currently still there on the analytics team. Um, and they were interested in my background. And so that sort of kicked off the interview process. And that's actually where like, um, you know, in our, in our book, one of the things we talk about is the powers of referrals, especially if you're looking at larger companies, uh, because they can often like, especially really big companies, like say like Google or Amazon, or, you know, even like Air Airbnb or something, which can literally get like thousands or tens of thousands of applications for these data science positions, like having, you know, someone who can, who can refer you, who can like help you just get your foot in the door a little bit can, can really be, be key. Gotcha. Uh, now coming to your journey, Jacqueline, uh, I'm sorry, my research is, isn't complete. I, I wasn't able to find the complete details, but from what I know, you founded your own uh, company and sort of started working from there. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, so me and um, Heather Nolas, we founded uh, Nolas LLC. And so I spent like the last two years before my new position doing independent consulting. So having like working for T-Mobile, Expedia, a bunch of other companies of like, they would hire, you know, specifically, you know, they're looking for someone who's like really an expert on data science, machine learning and AI to help them do various things, um, which was a very interesting uh, job track. You know, I had been consulting for other companies for a long time. And then to try going on my own was interesting. And it's interesting because a lot of people I've heard you know, talk to me like, oh, I'm really interested in doing freelance consulting. I want to be a consultant, an independent consultant. I want to do all these things. And the reason why it's interesting is it was terrifying, like the whole time, <laughs> because you never know, right? Are your contracts going to dry up? And do you have anyone else who would pay you for your time? Like, like there's so much uncertainty in it. And I feel like I was only able to, you know, get it to work for two years because having been a consultant for so many years, I did have a lot of people I worked at previous jobs, companies I had previously consulted for and they remembered me. Like I had a lot of this network and even with that network, it was still terrifying. So, um, you know, I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. I made some money, um, but I'm very happy now to be back in industry and have like, a, uh, it was amazing when I, when I have this job again and it's like, wow, they send me a paycheck <laughs> twice a month on time. Imagine it's not four months late and it's like, what? yeah. So, um, it was an interesting track, but like, yeah, it was actually, Emily likes to talk about this. We have a chapter in our book that talks about what are the things you can do as you get more senior in data science. And there's a part about being an independent consultant. And apparently the first draft, it was so negative. Emily's like, you got to dial it back. Um, and yeah. I had to like, yeah. <laughs> we tried to have, you know, for each. So there was like independent consulting, like a principal data scientist, a manager, and, you know, sort of had like pros and cons for each. And yeah, the independent consulting one, the first draft that I read, was just like, oh, just like, don't do it. Why would you ever do it? I think you, yeah. you, you said a thing before that you feel like the witch or something, you know, in front of like the story, like, you know, tell Cal here. Beware. Yeah. Beware. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I liked it. It went well. Um, but yeah, and especially with the virus and everything, it's just like, it is a very difficult situation to be in. So you have to be very well seasoned before you try it, I would say. Definitely. Uh, I, I started my own consultancy while I was in college because I wasn't allowed to have a job job. But my experience was when it rains, it pours. Otherwise, uh, it's a complete desert and you're just waiting for God's miracles to happen. Yeah, no, and that's a great point. Is sometimes the reverse happens where you have five companies who all suddenly want your time at once and then you're stressed for the opposite reason. Um, yeah, it's tough. It's very tough. 
Um, and even working as a consultant at a consulting firm, then at least then your bosses take on that fear and you don't have to mm. worry about it so much. But being independent is very tricky. So how did, uh, I'm, I'm just curious, how did you approach uh, different projects? What projects would you work on? And uh, it was network driven, but how would you um, sort of find these projects or convince the other side that uh, you'd like to, you, you, uh, you can work on the project because that's also a challenge of sorts? So for me, I found that if I had someone who was vaguely interested, it was fairly easy at that point. Um, because then it's a conversation. If someone came like on the, you know, on the, the website, they saw the website, they sent an email, then it's pretty easy to set, schedule a 30 minute call, talk about the, what their problem is, what you can do. That I thought was fairly easy. The hard part was getting to that point where someone's interested in you. And so it would be things from me just, po- you know, repeatedly posting on LinkedIn, talking about the, the kind of work I've done. So people in my network are like, oh yeah, Jacqueline's a consultant or whatever, you know, let's, let's you know, reach out. Um, but a lot of times it was, someone who I was a, you know, colleague of had a, someone who was saying, oh, I wish we just had one good data scientist right now. They'd be like, oh, I know one. Let me put you in touch with Jacqueline. So it was very much just having that network be out. And that's scary because it's not like you can suddenly make that network. It's like that network is there from years of your work and it will succeed or fail. You can't just like read one blog post on how your network will be better and then your network will be better. Um, so yeah, it was very much referral, word of mouth, um, you know, colleague, you know, colleagues who are also consultants using me when needed, um, things like that. And I, I guess uh, we'll get to this when we uh, talk about the book. You meet people out of just sharing interests or just getting to know what they're working on, but it's never hoping that they would help you get a job uh, in the future. Most of the times it's never that. Yeah. Yeah. So we talk about, we have a lot in the book. I mean, in fair number of times in the book, we talk about building your network. And I think Emily's much better at this than me. Um, but there's like... <laughs> I don't think I'm the best at it, but there is very much, yeah, you don't want to go in just very transactional, like, hey, um, um, I know you have job postings available and I'm interested. You like, you don't, you want to actually have a human relationship first, I would say. And that's why I often advise, like, build your network before you need it, because it is very hard to approach it. Like, like you can imagine if you're really desperate, if you're like, I am running out of money and I need a consulting gig now, like, it's really hard to, like, not be transactional because you have this really, you know, this, this deep need that's very pressing. And so that's why I often advise people, like, before you're in that situation, like, build your network first. Like, maybe, yeah, you don't need it urgently, but just start reaching out to people. I mean, Jacqueline and I met at the day-to-day Texas conference and, uh, you know, we were both speakers there. We liked each other's talks and, you know, neither of us at the time were, you know, Jack, Jacqueline had uh, a couple months later, Manning approached her about writing a book and she approached me, but I don't think at the conference, she was like, you know what, let me go and try to meet like potential co-authors and like, you know, vet them now. It's just- That Emily seems you know, like someone I write a talk. book with. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a fascinating topic. Um, just uh, curious, how, I, I know you've covered this uh, in the book as well, but uh, in hindsight, I know it might not have been uh, as complete of a process, but after you uh, got your first role in the industry, how did you uh, approach your journey from there? What different things would you learn? And uh, I know you've covered this uh, from different angles in the book as well. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, like once I started out at Etsy, um, in terms like, I think we often say, uh, you know, data science is a journey where you're pretty much always learning. And that's one of the things I say uh, when people are like, oh, I have to know these like hundred things before I can like possibly apply to jobs. It's like, you know, no, it, it's such a big field. There's always more stuff to learn and it's exciting. It can also be a little bit like paralyzing um, and make you feel like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to measure up. So definitely some imposter syndrome. But yeah, I mean, basically how I sort of approached it was you know, thinking of like trying new things, also valuing not just like new technical skills I was learning, but new experiences, like working with multiple teams and juggling projects or like working with a more senior analyst or more junior one. Um, And those experiences, you know, being really valuable, even if say it was like the project was technically something I was comfortable with. There were these other parts uh, that I was learning from. And then I would say the other part of it was just continuing to, um, you know, write some blog posts, share what I learned, like get more involved in the community and Twitter. And, you know, like, like you sort of were saying earlier, this wasn't with the idea of like, oh, this is definitely going to get me like more jobs in the future. Like this is why I want to do it. It it was sort of a multi-part thing of what it was. It was fun. Like I enjoyed, you know, writing and then sharing it. 
Um, two, it was a good way to like make connections with people. And I enjoyed just like having these conversations, getting to know folks. But also I thought like, you know what, there's so, I'm, I'm learning so much. Like I would, you know, six months ago, I would have loved to learn this. And this is a way I can give back to like other people who are in the position I was like six months or a year ago is just sharing what, I, what I've learned. Um, and, and, you know, helping them like understand like the data science space better. Yeah, and I would say um, for my journey, uh, so I kind of have a bias in my journey because I started so early. Like I, my first data science job was, and it was a call data science. It was like 2009. So I was like 10 years oh. ago and no one knew anything 10 years ago, right? Data science wasn't a term yet. And so there'd be a lot of times, like I remember very early in my first job, we had a problem where I noticed it was what we would now call an anomaly detection problem that we had at the company. But like, that wasn't really a term yet. And so like, I noticed there was this problem. So I'm like, I don't know, I'm gonna read up on like statistical quality control, which feels kind of related. And there's enough leeway that like, no one knew anything. So like, just be like, yeah, go read up on whatever and like try something, it's fine, was like very common. And I think mm -hmm. now, 10 years later, we have a lot more terminology. We have a lot more methods. There've been people in this field for 10 years. So if you're just starting, it's a little bit harder because there's not as much just like totally low hanging fruit. Um, but that said, I agree with Emily, like so much of what I know about being a data scientist, I did not learn by first getting a PhD or whatever. Like I didn't learn, most of what you learn is just by trying stuff out, messing up sometimes in meetings and having someone say, hey, you should maybe relate to your you know, stakeholders differently. Um, <laughs> like it's so much trial and error. And like, yeah, uh, just kind of what we were saying before in the talk, I think so much of my career has been a gradient descent where I either mess up something and then I'm like, okay, I shouldn't do that, let me try again. Or like, um, take a job and then four months into this job, I'm like, this is a terrible job for me. I don't want it. And then switch it, you know, like, so very much it's like, you know, it, experimentation is a part of data science, like AB testing, but also your career is in some way a continuous experimentation where you're constantly trying stuff. Um, and that I think for me has been really, um, really how I've kind of gotten to where I am today. And I, I guess you've covered this uh, maybe in other podcasts or in your blog posts. I, I've gone through so much content I've confused, but uh, Jacqueline, you would uh, get a, uh, so you, you'd get sort of mad at yourself when the models wouldn't work and that later you learned that's a natural process. Yeah, I did. And this is kind of, again, I mean, I'd say part of it because the feel so young, but this is still true, which is like, if you mess up a model, if you, if you okay, okay, so we're going to do a scenario. You're at a company and you, you, you have customer data, you're a retail company, you're like a shoe store. And you're like, hey, I think it would be a great idea to build a customer lifetime value model. So I want to predict how valuable each customer is in the future. So you have that and your bosses are like, great, go get it. That's awesome. And then you spend two months doing it and it doesn't work. And it doesn't work. And maybe it doesn't work because your customers never make more than one transaction because they're just really bad customers. Maybe it doesn't work because there's just nothing that you can use in the data that really does a good job of predicting how much people are going to spend in the future. Like it's almost random when people buy shoes. But for whatever reason, your model doesn't really work. And so a lot of my career was, this would happen. I'd be like, ah, oh, if only I was a better data scientist, this wouldn't have happened. I'd really beat myself up over it. But now as someone who's been around for a little while, it's um, a lot easier for me to say, hey, that's a very natural thing. Like there's no way you could have known when you were to suggest, let's try a CTLV model. There's no way you could have known at that point if it's gonna work or not. And just so much of data science is R&D, things often don't work. And so that's, that's fine. Um, but that journey from, I'm gonna really beat myself up every time these models don't work too. <laughs> hey, this is actually a very normal, natural part of this process. And if you aren't having failures, that's maybe a sign you aren't taking big enough risks. Um, that was a journey. What, what should one do uh, when these experiments fail? What would you suggest uh, them to do? Uh, a, they'd, they'd, they'd obviously be some disappointment, but once uh, they're over that, what, what should they do? The thing I would say more than anything is just communicate with your stakeholders, right? Like don't spend two months trying to fix it and not telling anyone. Let people know early, hey, this doesn't seem like it's working. I'm going to flag this as a risk, right? Before you even start the project, it's even best to be like, hey, we don't know if this will work. And if it doesn't, here's what we will do in that scenario. Like just being open with the communication is really the difference. The worst thing you can do as a data scientist is have a team expecting you to deliver results. And then six months later, be like, no, nah, I don't actually have anything. And I didn't tell you for six months. Um, that's like, that's a really bad scenario. So just the more you can avoid that, I think the easier these things go. And that really circles back to your advice of how, how do you learn about communicating with different people on teams and the stakeholders? Yes. And, um, 
I, I think Emily can probably talk to this too, but we, so much of when we talk about the book with like students and things like that, like always the thing people want to know is like, how do I get better communication? How do I deal with stakeholders better? How do I, like the communication seems like a thing that the senior data scientists we talk to are like, communication is like three quarters of this job. And the people who aren't senior yet are like, how do I get good at that thing that's three quarters of the job? I do not understand it. Um, yeah. Um. Okay, uh, do we no. have a way that they get better at it? Do we? Is it is it by a book? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, yeah. Um, we. I feel like so you left it, was, it hanging. You're like, there's this I really did. Oh, I was thing. wondering why everyone's so quiet. Oh, I was. Yeah. Like, oh, um, I was waiting for you so, to plug yeah, it. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, to say okay. how you learned it. Yeah. <laughs> so the way I think I learned it is again trial and error a lot. The more you can go out, make relationships, talk to people. Sometimes you mess up. Sometimes you say something in a meeting that doesn't come across well, but that's fine. But the more you kind of can work on communication, the better you get. And the more you're like, well, I'm a data scientist, so I'm just going to sit in front of my computer day and make models. And if people want to talk to me, that's their problem. I don't care. Like, that's like, don't get into there. Just try and constantly push yourself. Um, I don't know, Emily, what do you think? I think uh, you mentioned students. I do think for students, like one thing that helped me build my communication skills was doing extracurriculars in college. So I was in the student government and some like leadership programs. And I think that was really helpful. Um, like some of that is like public speaking communication, but also just working with other people, especially like student government. Um, so even if you're not a student, like are there, you know, like if you're at a company, maybe you could join like an employee research resource group or just like find different ways or, um, you know, I was on the board of Our Ladies NYC for a little bit of just like, you know, if, if you're not working in data science yet, um, you know, and maybe as, especially if you're still a student, just like ways to like, you know, working in cooperative groups and learning how to like work with people and persuasion and like seeing when things go wrong because people don't like update when they can't do stuff. You know, you think of like group projects in college and whatnot. Uh, I think that's one way to, to learn these skills. But like Jacqueline said, it also is just some trial and error. Like there's plenty of books on communication, which I think are like worthwhile to look at, but really at the end of the day, it's going to be practice that, that uh, helps you grow these skills and having someone who can give you feedback is the other thing. Like Jack and I also talk a lot about how important your manager is. And that is really helpful. If you have like Jacqueline gave the example of like someone coming up to you after and be like, Hey, maybe don't talk to stakeholders that way. Um, <laughs> maybe not quite that harsh, but uh, you know, but that, but that relies on like, sometimes you'll realize you did it wrong because the outcome like was bad or maybe the stakeholder tells you, but also sometimes that that doesn't happen. And that's where it's like really beneficial to have some teammates or a manager who can give you feedback um, on ways to like improve your communication. Yeah. And for me on that point specifically, having a mentor has helped at a po couple of points in my career just to have a person who I think does something better than me so I can like watch how they do stuff. So like I had a boss who was just really fantastic at like talking to like CEOs and stuff and being super chill and like having their interest. And I just watched like how he talked in meetings. I'm like, okay, he talks slowly and he takes a lot of pauses and it looks like he's really thinking and calm. Like, like having someone to model, I think really uh, is valuable too. I'm fresh out of college. It's, it's, almost been one year, but I still sort of beat myself up because I, I was a computer science uh, undergrad and as expected, I'd spend all my time in front of a computer. Uh, the audience doesn't get to see this. Uh, there was a few minutes of awkwardness uh, when all, all calls started was there today as well. I always beat myself up and I think it's, it's a process where uh, we out of whatever background we're coming out of, we have to go through this and learn, learn the threads of it. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, it's never too late, right? It's not like, well, if you didn't learn in college and take, you know, the, the extra calculations, you'll never learn it. Like, it's never too late. But yeah, the, um, it is a thing you kind of constantly have to be working at. Um, okay, so uh, transitioning back to uh, what you're working on today, can you share uh, the tasks you're working on? And what does a day, this is one of my favorite questions now, what does a day in your life on non-pandemic days look like? Emily, you want to go first? Sure. I can say. Yeah, I uh, think so about mine. <laughs> I've been working as a senior data scientist at Warby Parker since December. So Warby Parker um, started as one of the first direct-to-consumer companies uh, selling eyeglasses and sunglasses, uh, prescription, non-prescription online. And now they also have more than 120 retail stores, uh, just U.S. and Canada. Uh, so I started there in December, so a couple months pre-pandemic. 
And one of the really interesting things has been I work on a centralized uh, team. And so previously I'd been at Etsy embedded. So I reported to other data science analytics people, um, but I was embedded with the search team. And so the whole like year and a half I was there, I worked with the search team. Uh, and then at uh, my last company, I was fully embedded. I reported to the vice president of growth and I worked with the growth team, essentially an experimentation team. But at Warby Parker, our data science team is centralized. So there is, um, you know, uh, we work with uh, different departments across the, the company. And so usually, you know, anything from like um, maybe a couple of weeks to a couple of months on projects. Uh, and so that's been a really interesting and different experience versus like being with the same team, really getting to know them, like being in the, in the same Slack channels of them and all their meetings. Um, you know, and it has advantages and disadvantages that I think are really interesting, you know, on the one hand, of course, um, if you have only say like three data scientists, uh, if they're embedded, they can only cover like three teams, like maybe six teams. But I think once you get past like supporting two teams, it gets really hard versus if they're centralized, maybe they could help like, you know, 20 departments over the course of two years. But at the same time, you have less context. Uh, so yeah, so personally, a um, big thing I've been working on is uh, online experimentation um, at Warby. Uh, and so that's been something I've worked on before. We're doing it a little differently now. But the other thing I'm looking forward to is, yeah, in a couple of months, like I may be working on something completely different. Uh, and the team's done everything from more analytics projects to machine learning projects to kind of decision science, like support these like really big decisions that companies uh, making. And so that's also been uh, one of the things that attracted me to the team. I, I, again, I'm confused where did I read this, but uh, you, you had mentioned somewhere that it's also an interesting uh, place to be in where the data science framework is already set up and you're not the first uh, data science person on the team. Yeah, I think maybe this is, I, I don't know if that was Jacqueline. So I've actually never, I've never been the first data scientist on the team. Uh, Jacqueline and I actually have had some very interesting discussions. I, I don't want to be, I mean, it is true like here. Yes. So the, the kind of three senior people on the team joined Warby about four years ago. And so um, as they, they'd come from like a small uh, data science uh, consulting group altogether. Uh, so yeah, so like they set up a lot of the processes um, that, that we use now. Um, and yeah, that, that has been something nice. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I personally, Jacqueline loves being a first data scientist. Um, I, I personally kind of like having a, a, a bigger team to work with and not having to set everything up myself. And I, I think Jacqueline, for you, that might have linked back uh, to working as an independent consultant. Was, was that the reason? Yeah, well, uh, just I really like being the first data scientist because you get to set all the precedent, which is often mm. can be often true as well as an independent consultant a little bit. But like you get to say, like, well, what programming language are you going to use here? How are we going to store our code? Are we going to use Git? Are we going to use like a a network drive or whatever, I don't know, something terrible. So you always get, like, you get to kind of like lay the foundation that helps everyone grow, which is can be really fulfilling. It can also be really stressful. And when things, you don't have a way you know you want to do it, you can't go ask someone else because there's no one else around yet. Um, so I find that it, like, it's like an interesting puzzle to try, try and lay out the, the foundation for the team and the culture and things like that. But I also, to Emily's point, I can see why that's not a job that everyone would want. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to mention with, with even uh, jobs, it's sort of a running conversation. So there's also a learning curve after you join a team, things are going on already and you need to understand why are they using this tool? What do I need to do? How do I set that up? Yeah, that's why I don't like, that's why I like being the first because you don't have to do that. But if you're like the fourth, you go away and you'd be like, why are we storing our code in a network drive instead of on Git? And it could be turned out that there's a great reason. Sometimes there are great reasons for things. And sometimes it's like, oh, we didn't know the better thing. And, but then instead of just putting the better thing in, you have to be like, well, let's first figure out how we're going to shift things over from the bad thing to the good thing. And then how are we going to slowly turn off the bad thing in a way that doesn't hurt every other team? And like, I find that much more laborious than just like, let's do it right the first time. Um, gotcha. Uh, sorry, I interrupted you. Please uh, share with us what, uh, what tasks are you working on and what does a day in your life on non-pandemic days look like? Sure. So I am a, a principal data scientist at Brightloom. And so Brightloom is a startup that's focusing on using data science to help like restaurants and retailers through their marketing. Um, so I'm the lead data scientist on a team of six data scientists. And so what you kind of do as like a principal or like a lead data scientist is you, um, your job becomes a lot less coding, although there's that, but it becomes a lot more trying to just think about the bigger picture. So if there's one person on their team making a customer lifetime value model, and that model is going to output some data, 
and someone else is working on the team and they're thinking about making a new model, that model maybe could use that output as input to their model. And like you as the lead data scientist kind of have to be thinking like, well, how is these things all going to piece together? How blah, blah, blah. So like my job is very much more like an air traffic controller, I feel like, of like, <laughs> I'm trying to coordinate all these different projects. The leadership has ideas like we want the customer to be able to see experimentation. Well, how can we make sure that the experimentation stuff that the leadership's asking for doesn't break the model that someone else was thinking about. And so it's really my job to like kind of see that bigger picture and help enable all the data scientists on our team so everyone can do the best job they can. So my job is really to help all the data scientists from a technical perspective, really like build one good useful thing as opposed to us all be disconnected um, and that. So like my job is like 30% coding 50% trying to think about like getting all the stuff to work together. And then what does that leave? 20% like just also then thinking about like, okay, what's the vision? What's the big picture? What should we be working towards in a couple of months? Like selling that to the leadership. And that's kind of what I do for a, a living. Uh, uh, can you elaborate a bit on what projects uh, usually uh, take your interest on what projects do you, uh, are you involved in at Brightly? Sure. I'm trying to think of what I because we're like, we're a startup, we're just starting. So I don't want to like spill the beans too much. But basically like, suppose you're, um, if you're a restaurant, restaurants right now, what do they do? They send out a lot of emails and the emails they send out, they send out like often one email to all their customers. That's just mm -hmm. 10% off our pizza this week. But like, you really don't want to do that. You really want to not send a coupon to someone who is already going to buy a pizza. And if someone was going to buy a pizza, maybe you don't want to show them a pizza. Maybe for some customers, instead you show a soda. Right, and so this idea of actually having the marketing dynamically based on the customer input um, is generally regarded as a good idea. And then trying to do this specifically focused for like restaurants. And so that requires a lot of data science modeling, but it also requires a lot of thought in terms of like, well, what if the client company we're working with, the customer, what if they only have a set number of products they're willing to show? How does that change your models? What if they only wanna set, send emails at a certain rate? What if they don't wanna touch it at all? They want your model to do everything. And so the idea like, the actual work involved is much less the like, we're gonna build the mathematical statistical model to do the calculations and much more, how are we gonna think about how this whole ecosystem is going to feed into that model and how are the results gonna actually be valuable in a way that we can send the marketing out. And I think this is a lesson I've learned over and over and over and over in my career, which is people get so, data scientists specifically, get so focused on that model. Like, is it a 0.8 accuracy or is it a 0.82 accuracy? But, but like, it's so easy to focus on that. But like nine times out of 10, your success or failure isn't based on the model itself. It's based on all of this ecosystem stuff of like, well, how is the, like, how is the model gonna be used? How is it gonna connect to the engineering system? Is the client gonna understand the output? Ba, 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 ba. Um, and so that's kind of goes back to, it's a little bit goes back to the communication thing of the more you can better work with other people, communicate what it's doing, understand what they're asking for, the more likely you are to succeed rather than, well, did you use a random forest or did you use a neural network? Like that stuff, eh, less important. I, I, I guess you talk a lot about uh, this in the book as well. I'll just uh, start uh, transitioning into that. But first I want to know, I know both of you have written some amazing blog posts. I read almost all of them, not just for the purpose of research, but also because I enjoyed them so much. That led me to also watching almost all of your talks. So thanks, thanks for creating them. But was that a natural process to both of you? Uh, or uh, what in, in, in your uh, path, did it just come along the way? Maybe you can start with Emily. Yeah, uh, so thank you back to like my first blog post, uh, right, was about a little over four years ago when I was at Metis and it was just like a little sort of intro thing about this like from social scientist to data scientist type thing. And then my second one was a tutorial on Seaborn Python. And that came about because um, I start off the post as you might have read, uh, hating matplotlib because uh, I'd be coming from R, which is ggplot, like sort of by default makes like pretty good looking graphs. I was like, what is this like bright blue horror? And so I text my brother, he's a data scientist and he said, try Seaborn. And we had not been taught Seaborn in, in the bootcamp. And Seaborn, like just basically you just import it at the top of your Python file and it sort of like changes the default graphics, like also makes some like great statistical minded plots. And I just like really felt so passionately. I was like, more people need to know this. Like I can't let other people suffer. Like I was suffering in ignorance. Um, so I gave a little talk at my bootcamp and then published this blog post. But yeah, essentially I found that like, I don't blog on a regular schedule. Most, I mean, my blogs have sort of ranged from I think one of the most recent ones I, I, I wrote, a couple of them have like was like in a day or two of just sort of like 
One was on like analyzing Bob Ross paintings. And that was like a Tai Tuesday data set and just shared that. One was on um, Pokemon teams because I was doing Pokemon and I wanted to know what types to have on my team. Um, so people have really different styles. I know some folks like do have a regular blogging schedule. Some people write pretty short posts. Some people write long posts. For me, it's mostly been sort of like in some ways, like kind of waiting for inspiration. Um, but that being said, like not underestimating what you have to share. And so again, kind of thinking like, okay, a couple months ago, you know, what do I wish I had, I had known? Because you might think at first, oh, you know, I don't know, I'm so pretty junior, like for the Seaborn, I just learned it. But I was like, well, you know what? Like, there's many more people out there who don't know about Seaborn than who do. And so like even a beginning tutorial, like just like a, like a sort of selling Seaborn could be really valuable. Um, and that being said, my last point is uh, for my first speaking, I was attending the New York City School Open Programming Meetup, uh, which is run by Jared Lander. And so I was getting to know him. And he asked me, I remember, like just like a, a month into starting at Etsy, so when are you giving a talk? Like at my meetup, when are you going to give a talk? And I was like, oh, let's wait a little bit. Um, but he was really encouraging. He's been like a great sponsor. I've had other people as well who are like really um, – I tweeted once about like, I think it was like maybe writing a blog post on like, a, or maybe it was making a talk on like, um, I think it was like on, on these tidyverse packages and Hadley Wickham replied, who's, who's a very well-known R programmer is like, you should submit that to our studio conference. Um, so I do think, you know, I don't want to make it seem like I just like necessarily like came up with this was all self-motivated. There also were other people who are really encouraging me and giving me these opportunities. Um, and I have one of my blog posts is on sponsorship. And I think that is a really important thing of people who mentorship is advice giving, but sponsorship is really giving you opportunities. Um, and that, that is something like I've had sponsors who's, who've really like in some ways changed the, the trajectory of my career by giving me some of these opportunities. Um, for the audience that haven't uh, yet read hooked on data.org, uh, amazing name, by the way, Emily, please <laughs> head over there right now and check out all of the posts out there. And I, I think this is a, repeat, a repetitive theme that's come on the podcast. Uh, Rachel Thomas talks a lot about this, which is many people in the senior position, even though they're knowledgeable, might not remember the struggles of learning something for the first time, like Seaborn back in the day now, I think they have a few tutorials and it's it's really valuable to people who are just starting out to be able to relate to that or read that. Yeah, absolutely. It's like often your best position to teach someone like who's a step behind you rather than the expert who's kind of forgot what that beginner's mindset is. Absolutely. And uh, coming to the topic of speaking at different events, I, I remember Jacqueline had mentioned in, I think, some podcasts, it's it's like a rock band where you start by playing at your local uh, area, eventually <laughs> leading up to a stadium. Yeah. Um, and I actually remember, so... I remember going to conferences before I spoke with them first. And I remember like watching sometimes people speak and I'm like, oh, I want someday I want to be a rock star. Like I want to go to conferences and talk to him. I think it was Julia Silge. I, uh, I saw her talking at a day to day Seattle. I'm like, ah, that's like someday that'll be me. And then, yeah, it's like um, these kind of all feed into each other. So if you do some um, blog posts and sometimes you can maybe go talk at a meetup and then you talk at a meetup, someone you'll get practice. So when it comes time to make a, talk for a conference, like a full conference, you'll be more ready. And like, it does kind of build up. Um, yeah, and for me, I, um, I, I start, I kind of like, it's kind of the same thing. I, I watched people write blog posts for a while. I'm like, I should write blog posts. And then at one point I was in a position at a job. At one point I was a, the first data scientist and eventually I needed to start other, hiring other data scientists, which I'd never done before on my own. And so I started writing a blog series of blog posts about that. Of like, how do you hire a data scientist? And this is like kind of the thing, like I was like, this is gonna be a four part series. And it took me a year before that four part series was done. But like, that's fine. Like the first two came out quickly and then I waited three months for the third and then I waited nine months for the fourth. And I think it's very easy to kind of be like, and then your blog isn't public and everything has to be perfect and all that. But like, no, it's kind of like, it's like your fun side thing. And so um, for me, it really was just like, hey, I'm doing something at work that I, I, I want to talk to a bunch of people about, but you can't just be like, hey, I want to talk to you about hiring data scientists. So I'm like, oh, I will take that, that feeling inside me of wanting to share and just turn it into a blog post and we'll just see what happens. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, um, that's kind of how I got into it, I would say. Okay, uh, you, can, you can find the link on Jacqueline's website, which is jnollis.com. Uh, for for me, I uh, I know both of you are amazing speakers, but for me, I, I used to struggle a lot with shaky hands when I'd be on stage, maybe a little bit now as well. Now I'm lucky I can put it out of the frame and it doesn't appear, but I feel 
that was uh, that with meetups it was a place where i could go comfortably as nervously as i could and that's fine people would probably forget that in one day and uh, not beat myself up over that so that also helped me i think become somewhat better uh, a somewhat better speaker by just showing up at every meetup and trying to present something so i find that's- i'm less nervous speaking like speaking i can go up i'm fine i can do that. but i'm terrified of like sitting at a table of strangers at lunch at a conference or something and like having to introduce myself then i'm so nervous so like for every person it's different and like it's that's i'd say that's still and that's still to this day i get nervous when i do that so like it's yeah but what helps with the table of strangers is if you've given a talk then they all know you already and so then uh like i actually say um public speaking i think is great for introverts because of this because then people will like have something to come up to you and like talk to you about um rather than you feeling like oh i gotta really go like put myself out there and like introduce myself to people I actually admittedly think that's worse. Like, I, I hate that. Like, if, if like, oh, we saw your talk. You like, I don't know any of you, and you know me. This Ooh, feels like, whoa. oh, really? I like it. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, oh, famous. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great hack, though. Uh, coming, coming to the book, I know you both connected uh, a few months after you met at the conference. Uh, why were you convinced on the idea to write a book about this topic? Uh, it's, it's more about uh, things that aren't covered at all. So I, I think people can know the importance, but at first, it might not have been apparent to you. Why, why did you uh, decide to write it? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, as we talked about earlier, so Manning had reached out to Jacqueline. Um, try to, I don't remember maybe she, when she comes back, she would say whether it was specifically about careers. Um, I think it was. I think at least from when Jacqueline reached out to me, it was like clearly like this was sort of the, the broad topic of the book. Um, for me, I think part of it is I had been like talking to people. And I think a lot of it came from my background in organizational behavior. Um, because you learn like the first, like when I learned about sponsorship versus mentorship, there's a lot of research on that and like research, uh, like one line of research is that women, for example, are often over mentored and under sponsored and sponsorship is what really can get you like advance your career more than mentorship. Um, and just these other topics of like negotiations, like around job negotiations. And so I felt like, oh, I have this knowledge from my previous background, um, that I would like to share with people. And then kind of exactly what you said about, um, you know, I feel like there, there is a ton of like technical advice out there, but there's both, in some cases there is like, you know, kind of career advice um, out there. Like there are definitely some good blog posts and stuff on this, but it wasn't really in like one like cohesive, like one place you could look at it. And there were some topics that weren't covered. It's so, like one of the chapters of our book that actually we initially hadn't planned on, but uh, I think we added later was a second chapter on data science at different companies, which is something we hadn't really seen, but we thought was really important for folks to understand uh, you know, data science is not just at tech companies, it's at all these different companies and what are some of the pros and cons and like how it'll be different working there. Uh, so Jacqueline, I didn't want to ask you, I couldn't remember it. Do you remember, did Manning specifically reach out to you about like writing a kind of career focused book or was that like they, your decision? No, they saw my blogs at that point. Mm. And, and which is interesting because at this point I have like four times as many blog posts as I did then. So it, I guess it doesn't take that much to get started, but they, they just wanted a book. And they're like, write whatever you want. I mean, you seem to write a lot about career stuff. But like, what do you, what would you be interested in? And then I quickly was like, well, the only stuff I feel like confident to talk about is career stuff. And then I reached out to you because you also seem like a person who would feel confident talking about career stuff. So Yeah. And I think I had written at that point, the blog post on like mentorship versus sponsorship, for example, and building your network. So I'd written some like posts around the topic. Uh, it, 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 it's really interesting. Um, you start with writing blog posts and like, like you would mention, it's sort of a fun side gig that you're just enjoying writing about things you've learned. People end up reading it. And that also leads into, I know book uh, writing is a much more rigorous task, but uh, once it's complete, uh, people get to read the book, they get to know you. So that's also one of the ways I think uh, that you can advance your career in, in some different directions, I feel. Yeah. And you know, it takes a while sometimes. Like I, there are people I follow on Twitter who like have written blogs for like a year or two, or like they have that email subscription. And then only like in the last, you know, couple of weeks or whatever, they finally feel like they're really like, you know, it's kicking off. And now they, they wrote that article that everyone shares and they get all the followers. So then I, like, like sometimes it just takes a while and you never know. Um, it is one of these things, the more that you're not just writing a blog post in a vacuum, but you're out on Twitter and you say, hey, here's my new blog post. And you're commenting on other people's stuff. And you're like, actually that relates to my blog post. You know, like not, like not in a tacky way, but like the more you're making it a part of the conversation, I think that can help. But like, yeah, it's these things just kind of all build off each other. 
I, I feel like Twitter, uh, still to date, the Twitter ML community is very underrated and the Reddit ML community is much overrated. Uh, maybe that's just me, but that's my personal take. Um, I would say I like the Twitter data science community. I would say, you know, so if, when I think about Twitter for data science and like R specifically, which is more what I'm involved in, I find it quite strong. But there are other social media platforms that people talk on about these things and I won't name names, but there are other <laughs> ones that I find very bad and negative and destructive. And I think oh, yeah. Twitter is a very positive one. Yeah, I think that I, I sort of with Jacqueline that there can be some, especially like very bro -y, um places and very gatekeeping. And uh, like Jacqueline said, like, especially like the R community on Twitter is like the exact opposite. Like when I see people post like, hey, I'm like learning R for the first time and like just showing the, like a, you know, pretty simple graph that they made. Those are just all these replies that are like people so excited and they're like, do you need resources? You know, you can join, join this community. like. Allison Horst is someone who's who's awesome, who is an artist in residence at our studio, and she draws these like little um, pictures, like little like beautiful cartoons, like little monsters, and like just different things, like like but very cute fuzzy monsters, um, like trying to make these accessible. And she she started this because she was you know teaching classes. She'd find like she was really excited about this topic, but but when she just showed some like code on the board, these students who had never coded before like weren't excited. So she's like, how can I get them engaged? So, like let me make little fuzzy monsters and. I don't know. I just love it because I feel like it's such a, a a warm and welcoming community. And I do think part of that is the Our Ladies um, group uh, that was founded back in like 2012 or something. That is just a, a global community of uh, for women and gender minorities uh, learning R, like sharing R. Um, yeah, but I, I, I would agree with Jacqueline that there can be some uh, toxic communities like other parts and to really try uh, n not not to feel like, um, not to take necessarily the things at face value, right? Which is like, ah, uh, you know, if you don't have a PhD in this, like, you know, you, you, you're not like a real data scientist or like boot camps are like all terrible. Like anyone who's done a boot camp, uh, you know, like can never be like, you know, a real data scientist. Just You're uh, not a real data scientist until you've trained a TensorFlow on a GPU and with at least yeah. K teraflops of <laughs> cloud. And it's like, that doesn't, no, like, uh. <laughs> I 100% agree with you and uh, I, I feel the community is always kinder to newcomers because uh, whenever someone sees their first blog post, the community makes sure that up to, I, I, I distinctly remember the number of retweets I got with my first blog post and that's that's been the biggest encourager to me to continue with it, although maybe the quality might not have gone up, but I still kept, kept at it. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think just, yeah, just find a place on the internet where you can get resources and you, yeah, you feel like you're getting that support. If you're like, yeah, if you're reading lots of, if you're in so, some social media platform where you feel like people are being negative or like making you feel less good about your job, then like, pff, get feel like you don't need that negativity in your life. Absolutely. Uh, I'm trying to maybe sound too smart, but I was sort of structuring the interview along the outline of the book. It's in four parts. Maybe I'll let both of you highlight it better, but the first one is getting started with data science. So I started by talking about your journey, followed by finding your data science job, settling into data science and growing your role. Uh, can you walk us through the outline? How did you decide on it? And uh, what are people going to get out of it? Uh, what, what can they expect out of these? So I would say, you know, we kind of had a goal when we were like, before we even set up the four parts, we kind of had the goal of like, we wanted this to be a book that if you're not yet a data scientist and you want to be one, this book would help you. Um, so, which is a lot, cause a lots and lots of people come to us and like, Hey, I'm not yet a data scientist. I'm interested. And so we wanted this book to be for them. But at the same time, we wanted this book to also be for people who were data scientists, that they would still get something out of value out of it too, of like, okay, you've been a data scientist. Maybe you're a little more on the junior side, but like, what are the things that can help you get to the next level as well? And so from there, we're like, okay, there's really then two halves to the book. The first half is how do you get to the, your first data science job? And your second half is, okay, you're in your first data science job. What happens in that job and beyond? And then, okay, so let's put up the first half again. Then there's the even more basic of like, what is data science? How do you get the data science skills? All of that. And then the second, so part two, so part one is like, what's data science? What, what is it all about? How do you get the skills? Part two is literally, how do you get that first job? Resumes, job postings, interviews, blah, blah, blah. Then part three is, okay, you're in that first job. What do you do? How do you get good at that first data science position? And then the fourth part is, all right, how do you move beyond that? How do you quit your first job? How do you become a manager? How do you join the community? Um, and so that's kind of how the progression, I would say, played out. 
I, I don't know, Emily, does that, am I missing anything? No, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. I, I feel like to date, uh, no other book or no other resource covers these things. And th- this is a process that I feel everyone has to go through. It was kind of astounding, I think. I was half expecting when we were in the beginning part of writing the book that we would just stumble upon, oh, this book written already. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I think there were a couple of points, Emily, where I was like, wait, 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 is this the book that we already wrote? And it's like, no, 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 that book's not quite. No, no, no. Um, and it's also this book, so far as I can tell, this book does not exist for the field of software engineering. either. Like there's a lot of, there could be a lot of iterations of this book, but it seems by and large, people are more interested in writing here's another book on TensorFlow or something, then they are on, here's a book on really just career progression in a technical field. Um, which is, I don't know, I, I was surprised by that, I guess. Um, yeah, for, for sure. Uh, I, I, I was just going through the contents to see what, what parts we've already talked about. Uh, I, we, we've talked about almost half of the book uh, through your journeys, but I'm curious, uh, Settling up, maybe maybe we can talk about the topic settling into data science and growing in your data science role. What advices would you have for those uh, parts? And I I hope people would check out the book because it'll be in a lot more detail in the book. But for what what you can share on the podcast? Yeah, I can I can start. Uh, so for the settling, um, no, I think one thing like the first chapter in that section is. Uh, you know, your first like months on the job basically and onboarding. And I do think um, there's like some key points there of uh, just working to understand, we sort of alluded to this earlier, but I remember I was really thankful when I joined Etsy, um, one of the other managers saying to me, like, it's gonna take you six months to really feel like, you know, like kind of confident in this role and like, you kind of know what's going on. And that was so helpful because it, it you know, I, I, otherwise I think I would have felt like really bad, like, why don't I understand these things? But it just takes a while to learn the, especially if you join a company, right. That always has established data science. Like what are the practices? What are the analysis that have been done? What are all these data sets? What are the gotchas in them? Like, you know, or even just like little things about like company norms and stuff around, uh, like, I don't know, how long do, do people take for lunch? Like, you know, do people set emails? Like, do you need to message before setting a meeting on someone's calendar? Or is it okay just to like put it on there? Just all of these things when you start a new job. Um, so that's just one thing I want to convey is these things do take a while to learn. And there are some like structured ways you can, you can go about learning them. Um, and, you know, like one example is like kind of um, just setting up coffee chats with like the people on your team, talking with them, like not uh, underestimating the importance of like getting to know people and relationships versus just trying to be like head down and being like, I must be like as productive as possible immediately. Um, because that I think is actually shooting yourself in the foot a little bit versus like being like, okay, it's okay. It's going to take me a little more time. Let me like meet these people and also start figuring out like, okay, how do I be productive, not just like right now, but in the longer term and like set up some systems for myself? Um, You know, so maybe that's making like a little bit uh, a small package because you find yourself doing these tasks over and over and and just, you know, being willing to take that time and and not uh, worrying too much like, oh, I have to like prove right away like that it was worth it, like hiring me Um, because, you know, people expect it to take you a little bit of time to ramp up. That's, That's amazing advice. Jacqueline, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would just say then the other parts, the other, no, the other chapters in that part kind of talk a little bit more about like, what is an analysis? What makes a good analysis? Like, how should you think about structuring your analyses? And then we have another chapter, same thing, but production code. What makes your production code good? If you're going to be doing machine learning for production, what do you got to be thinking about? And those chapters are not just for the people doing that work, but if you're someone who's primarily doing analysis, it's still good to know what production is and about. And if you're doing mostly production work, it's still good to know what makes an analysis good. And then the last part of that is we have a whole chapter on talking about talking with stakeholders, which I think we've talked a lot already in this podcast about the communication part, but it's literally just a chapter of, okay, here's how you think about communicating to the engineering team versus your executives. Um, um, yeah, we got a great quote from Elizabeth Hunter, the, I think, executive vice president, maybe senior vice president, some high level vice president at T-Mobile um, on this sort of a topic. And uh, as I was going through the book while preparing for this, at every single page that I would flip or almost chapter, I would go, why haven't I found this book earlier? Because I I feel like everyone comes into data science from a completely different background. Some people do software engineering, for some it's their first role. 
or some maybe they've never coded and i think this this is something to uh, to be learned for everyone from any walk of life that are stepping into this sort of new field yeah thank you and i think one part in there um i don't think we've talked about yet is uh so jacqueline just mentioned we have this little excerpt from elizabeth hunter we also have interviews at the end of every chapter um like with a different uh data scientist on the topic of that chapter and part of the reason we wanted to do that is showcase like okay here's someone who's like an engineering manager at google here's someone who was like you know, the first data scientist here, here's someone who came from like a um, astrophysics PhD and just really showcasing that there are all these different backgrounds or all these like people doing all different types of jobs within data science. Um, and yeah, just having not only our own voices in the book, but also the experiences of lots of different people because it is such a big and diverse field. Yeah. Um... And just to your point earlier about like, wow, I wish I had gotten this earlier. Um, you know, I think we've had a lot of that feedback of just like, wow, this like, geez, like, it seems like this is really, so and I think the thing is, is that like, you know, some of the stuff like, okay, maybe you've heard about doing a project portfolio before. So like, maybe that section is not new, but like, you put like, there's no book that puts it all together. And like, there will be something for everyone in here. And that's, I think, one of the cool things of having this be a book as opposed to like 20 blog posts or something is it is just like, okay, I have a, I want to just get better at my career. I'm reading through all this book and then I will, you know, I will feel like I'm better suited for uh, going out and trying to get the job I want. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the interviews at the end of the chapters. Just wanted to highlight that. And uh, it's, it's really interesting. You read the chapter, you understand uh, both of your perspective and then you go, Hey, I recognize this person. He also says the same thing. Yay. Yeah, we are really happy. We got a lot of uh, really supportive people to be our interviewees. Um, so very, very friendly, very helpful. Um, and it was amazing just how many themes kind of went across everyone from the, hey, watch out about being the first data scientist at a company was another one versus the, hey, it's not just about building a good model. It's about communication, all that. Like there's just some things that constantly were showing up in what everyone was saying. It, it definitely comes across as an amazing book. I. I I, I do a lot of interviews. I know it takes a lot of efforts, but uh, I, I hope the community learns a lot through, through the book. Maybe they pick it up and uh, they'll, they'll know what I'm talking about. Coming to the final topic of uh, growing in your data science role, uh, if you could share your advice on that. And one of the important topics that I almost is not covered, it's sort of whispered in the back alleys of jobs, which is leaving your job gracefully and moving up the ladders. Could you please... Uh, highlight a few uh, tips on that or what you uh, you'd like to get across to the audience yeah uh so I'll, I'll start on that yeah i think that is you know and i think it's an important topic too because like taking it a step back of um when especially when you're looking for your first data science job um that is one of the toughest jobs to get because especially now there's there are a lot of aspiring data scientists and that's why I think it's important to know, like, look, when you when you take a job, it doesn't have to be the perfect job. And uh, part of that is because like, it's very common after like a year, two years to like move on um, to find a different job. And so you should, you know, have standards, like try to find something where you learn from, but it doesn't have to be like the perfect thing. And, uh, you know, I, I think that can be a barrier is, for example, people being like, well, I only want a job that has a title data scientist. Like I want to be a data scientist. I want to be a data scientist. And especially for people coming out of undergrad, like I think that's starting to just not be an entry level title for uh, undergrads, maybe for like masters or PhDs. Um, but saying like, hey, you know, I'm going to get a job as a data analyst where I can do some programming, like you know, being like, there's going to be a lot to learn just from like it being my first, you know, if you're coming out of undergrad, my like first, you know, like full-time job. Uh, and, and I'm going to learn a lot of like these communication, like, you know, all, all these sorts of things, uh, you know, and then in a year or two years or three years, like maybe I become a senior data analyst, maybe I get that data science job and so on. Um, yeah, like on specifically on leaving, I think a uh, big part is it's like, how do you even know? <laughs> like, how do you know if you should leave? Right? Like sometimes a, a you know, sort of in, in bad scenarios, maybe it's, it's quite clear, like this is like, and we talk some about this in the book, like it's a toxic workplace, or, you know, it's just like, you're, it, it's just like very obvious to you, like, I got to get out of here. But other times you might be like, well, like, I don't know, like, this is fine. Like job searching is such an exhausting process. It's like, do I really want to go through that? Like, will it actually be better? And that's why I think one of the things I say is to, you know, you may not want to tell your manager you're thinking about leaving, but like talk to them and see what is changeable because you may be surprised. Like, for example, uh, you may not realize, like maybe you're at a smaller startup, like 
you could hire an, like, like your manager would be willing to hire an intern for like 10 or $15 an hour. Um, that could help with like some of, some of the, like, you know, more kind of routine tasks that you're tired of. It could get you mentorship experience. And, and you might've never thought of that if you didn't bring up to your manager, like, look, I, you know, like th this stuff is like really weighing on me. Like, I feel like I'm not learning anymore. Um, and, and so on. So, so one, like trying to figure out, okay, what, what might be changeable? Like what, how could you kind of job craft in the job you're already in? And then, okay, if you, if you sort of try that, if you find, but, but maybe it's, for example, you're like, well, I just don't want to work at a startup anymore, right? Like that's not changeable. It's like, I want to work at a bigger company. I want there to be like, you know, these advantages. Um, you know, I, I think one job searching is, uh, you know, it's kind of like similar, similar tips to like your first one. It's not like you throw out everything, you know, but we do say it's going to be hopefully a little bit easier once you have experience. Um, you know, you have some relevant job experience uh, using your network that maybe you've built up um, and really just being being thoughtful um, about like, what are the things that are important to you? Like, hopefully you learned some stuff, right? Like maybe you did learn like, oh, I wanted to be on a team with more data scientists. Oh, or the opposite. Like, hey, I find things really slow moving. It turns out I'd actually rather be like at a smaller organization that is like a little more fast moving and nimble. Um, so, so really like being thoughtful about like rather, you know, if you're not in a really bad situation, not just trying to like find the first thing to jump to, but really trying to find a, a, a better fit. And I I, I just want to circle back to the point you mentioned earlier, which was having coffee with your team members. Uh, most of the times, uh, I feel at least in my journey, I wouldn't reach out to people that are senior. And that's, that's where that is helpful. That allows you to uh, relatively have those uh, tough talks more, more easily, if that makes sense. To have like the, those relationships already built with the senior people, you mean? Uh, yeah, uh, what I was referring to was uh, reaching out to them and letting them know, hey, I want to learn this. Uh, this thing is just weighing out on me. And if you mm, know them yes. to a personal extent, it's easier to get that conversation going. I mean, Jacqueline, and you, you've managed and I'm sure had team members leave. So I don't know if you want to talk about yeah. that. Um, you know, it's weird. I think I'm a weird person because I, when I've had people let, leave, I'd always feel like happy. I'm like, yeah, it's sad that they're leaving, but I'm like, they, they are going to do something that is better for them. And I think that's always something that should be celebrated. celebrated. That being said, I know many managers are upset when people leave their teams. So like, I don't think that's normal. Like, I don't think I'm a representative sample, but like, yeah, I mean, the whole point of leaving is you're saying, hey, I'm doing something for myself that will make me happier. I'm like, that's, that's good. Even if it maybe isn't necessarily the best for the company that you're leaving. Yeah. I remember my first manager said pretty much exactly that. He's like, you know, he was saying he's unhappy if he feels like people are, are like more running away from something at the, at, you know, the company. Um, because I think often he feels like, oh, I wish we could have worked and like maybe try to fix that or change that. But he's happy when it's like, oh, you're going for like just something that's going to offer you different that we can offer you. And I think as long as you do it in a, you know, respectful way. So like in the U S it's standard to give two weeks notice, right. Um, to just kind of, be thoughtful about like, you know, not, not burning bridges behind you. Like, even if, you know, again, the sort of like, I'm talking about not a very extreme case where it's like, oh, there was like tons of harassment, other toxic thing, but like, you know, thinking about like, okay, how can I try to like leave on a good note? Like rather, you know, so maybe uh, with my projects, try to wrap up where I can or where I can't like leave some detailed notes and think about like who might be able to take this over. Um, and I think in that case, like if your manager is upset, like that's on them and not on you. Um, and it's a very normal thing for people to, you know, leave jobs to, you know, just continue to grow to find opportunities elsewhere. And, and a good manager should be, should be happy for you um, that, that you're, you know, continuing on your journey. That's, that, that's where I feel uh, the title is sort of complete. It's not just leaving your job, it's leaving your job gracefully. That, that sort of wraps up the book, but I know you've continued the conversation quite literally in a podcast. Can you share a bit about the podcast and uh, do you have any plans? Uh, what, what can we expect out of it? Yeah. So um, the podcast is actually Emily's idea because we, um, we, um, we realized that, you know, like with our book, we have 16 chapters in there of like good content and stuff. But there's all these stories like that came up in this podcast where it's like stories about like, well, how did this happen? How did this play out on our first job that you maybe don't want to put in a book, but are like actually really useful and interesting and kind of shine a light on things. So we've recently launched a podcast. One episode is out now. They're coming out every other Thursday. And each to start each episode of the podcast is us talking about the chapter. So like, 
okay, well, what went into us? What were we feeling when we were writing it? Like, why did we say this? What's the story here? Um, we try to have fun with it. We play some games. So there's like, like, um, yeah, we, we just really try to have fun with it and make it um, a good time. But really it's the point is, is that you could read the book, which please do, it's great. Um, <laughs> You can read Build a Career in Data Science. You could also listen to the podcast, Build a Career in Data Science, which talks about the book. If you do both, they kind of work well together, but also you could just listen to the podcast or just read the book and that's fine. Um, yeah, and so we're really excited about it. Um, we've got a lot of good episodes on the way. Like I said, one's out now and like we have a bunch of them already recorded. And, like we have, they, they get really good. I, I'm really um, pleased <laughs> with how good, you know, how, how they came out. Yeah, and I think like Jacqueline said, we really try to make it a, a nice balance of, um, you know, like, some of the main takeaways of the book, like like important stories we think are illuminating from our own career. So kind of like very like useful tips and stuff, but also fun, like just some fun stories. Like we don't want this. It, it's, it's definitely not a, I would say, I remember one of my coworkers messaging me, she'd listen to the podcast and like our intro that we give to it is like, you know, the only part we script, we're like, welcome to build a career in data science, blah, blah, blah. And then she messaged me thinking like, she was like, I thought this would be like a very serious podcast. And then I started <laughs> listening it. and Jacqueline, and I, like I said, you know, like we, we do, try to give some like, you know, good takeaways, good advice, but we also just have fun with it. And I think we have some, uh, it, I've really enjoyed recording it. I've learned some stories from Jacqueline about her career that I hadn't known before. Um, and I think like Jacqueline said, you can, it, it can be a very good compliment to the book, but also it can, it can stand on its own. Yeah. It's not just us reading the book for 45 minutes. No. It's like, no, it's, <laughs> yeah, like, it's, it's, it's a good time. Yeah. <laughs> I, at the time of recording, just the first episode is out. I think a few more would be out by the time this goes out. But I really enjoyed the first chapter. Uh, to my audience, I, I'm sure you would enjoy that podcast a little more than this one. So oh. just uh, oh, search for... A, I, I... <laughs> We're having fun. I'm having fun here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but for the audience, please uh, search for Building a Career in Data Science. I think on any platform, they should be able to find the podcast. Should be, yeah. Yeah, and the URL is uh, podcast podcast dot best book dot cool, and there's yeah. like a little page too with all the links. The, the book is the book's website is best book yes. dot cool. The podcast is podcast dot best book dot cool. Yeah, we are really we we've had a lot of fun with that URL as well. <laughs> If you didn't catch that, you can find that in the show notes as well. Uh, usually I try to end these interviews on one repeat question, uh, trying to condense advice into one, which is what's, what, what's the best advice you would have for someone who's just starting out uh, the journey today uh, from any walk of life, uh, just starting their data science journey? Okay, so here's my advice. And I feel like I've been asked this question before and the advice changes every time. So um, I think this is my advice today, which is really, I think... The, you know, uh, as a junior data scientist, your kind of goal is to like take in as much as you can and do like build the best with what you're told to do, right? Build a customer lifetime value model that does these things. Go out and do that. But that only goes so far. And eventually your job becomes more and more to be the person who says, hey, we need to build a CTLV model right now and like have the ideas. And so the more, as a junior data scientist, it's easy to say like, well, I have this idea, but like, but... No one else is talking about it and I'm not sure, so I'm not gonna do anything with it. But those ideas, those, those intuition of like, what if we tried doing something differently? Or those are the things that can really, um, that's really the difference between junior to senior to principal is more and more how do you act on those. So don't quash those, like really explore them and give yourself the space to try stuff, to learn, to see what happens. And it, it, as we said, it doesn't always work. It rarely works, but you usually learn stuff on the way. And I would say, uh you don't have to do this alone, like find a community, whether it's, you know, again, in COVID times, uh, meetups aren't meeting in person, but like maybe there are online ones or through Twitter or other places, um, you know, just try to find other people who are going through the same thing, or maybe are a couple steps in front of you. Uh, Angela Bassa created this website, uh, datahelpers.org, where people um, like, you know, put, gave a little bit of a, a summary about themselves and you can, and their contact info, you can reach out to them. Uh, and with that, like, don't see your previous stuff as if, if you do come from sort of a quote unquote non-traditional background, like, don't think of that as like, oh, that was such a waste of time. Why didn't I major in like statistics or computer science? I can't believe I did like English literature, like really try to, you know, those are very valuable, like whether it's through the domain knowledge you have, like maybe you come from a healthcare uh, background. And so maybe you want to work in healthcare data science and that's super useful, or, or you were a sales executive, you can work with a, a sales team on data science. Um, or, in a, you know, in your major, you, you learned a lot about communication of, of really, you know, try to find a supportive community 
and don't listen to the gatekeepers um, because there are so many more people out there who really want to welcome you into the field and recognize that you have something uh, valuable to offer. That's, that's amazing advice. Uh, now, b- before we end the call, uh, I-, I mentioned a few broad platforms, but uh, if you want to add anything where the audience can connect with you, what would be the best platforms uh, where they can connect with you? So sure, for me... For me oh. Oh. <laughs> Emily, you can go first. Okay. Uh, So you mentioned my blog, uh, hookedondata.org. So it has uh, my blog posts, also um, recordings of all my talks or the slides. Um, I'm on Twitter at Robinson underscore ES. And on LinkedIn, you can find me at Emily Robinson. Uh, Just a quick note on LinkedIn. I I do get a a fair amount of like connection requests. And so if you want to connect there, like, please write a quick note. That's like, Oh, I heard you on this podcast. Like, you know, that's why I'm reaching out. Uh, because generally I, I, I don't accept connection requests of people I don't know with, without any kind of info of why they're asking to connect. I do the emoji, uh, while, while sending the request, maybe uh, Emily will accept it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, and for me on Twitter, I'm Sky Tetra, and this is not easy to spell. It is S K Y E, so Sky with an E, and then Tetra, T E T R A. I'm thinking about changing that to something where you spell. But um, so that's on Twitter, and Twitter is almost the only place I ever use. So if you try and link in connect on me, it won't work because I don't really check that. Um, so really, go to Twitter um, to connect with me. Um, and yeah, besides that, all of me and Emily's stuff is bestbook.cool or podcast.bestbook.cool. Awesome. Uh, for anyone who missed any of these links or was too lazy not to type it out while listening, uh, you can find them in the show notes and uh, click on any one that you want to use. Uh, thank you so much, Emily, and thank you so much, Jacqueline, for joining me on thank the you. podcast. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.